This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. We will be moving forward swiftly on those articles. It's long overdue. Only one cabinet secretary has ever been impeached by the House, and that was in 1876. But House Republicans are trying to make that happen again, this time to Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The Republicans who are leading the impeachment inquiry say that Mayorkas has been ignoring the law and accuse him of creating the crisis at the border. Here's the chair of the Homeland Security Committee, Republican Mark Green. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas took a similar oath, but he has not lived up to it. He has willfully and systematically refused to comply with the laws passed by Congress and breached the trust of Congress and the American people. But Democrats, like committee ranking member Benny Thompson, say that Republicans are confusing law with policy and that Mayorkas has acted within his authority to enforce current immigration laws. He's leveraged the full range of authorities at his disposal while stretching the resources provided by Congress to secure the border. He has removed record levels of migrants detained by more people than Congress has provided funding for and prevented record levels of fentanyl from entering our communities. And Democratic Congressman Dan Goldman says it's pure hypocrisy to impeach Mayorkas while he's working with a group of Senate Republicans to craft a bipartisan deal on immigration, a deal that House Republicans refuse to consider. The committee vote to advance the impeachment articles against Mayorkas was 18 to 15, down party lines. Joining me is an expert on impeachment, Michael Gerhard, a professor at the University of North Carolina Law School. I'd like to start with the basics. Explain the standard of high crimes and misdemeanors needed to impeach someone. Those terms refer to serious abuses of power or misconduct on the part of the people who are impeachable that seriously hurts the republic. So there's nothing definitive. It's a broad category. Well, it's a broad category, but I don't think it lacks definiteness. I think it just means that it creates a metric which ought to sort of recognize that some things are going to fall below it and some things are going to fit. You know, jaywalking won't qualify, but a president's lying to the Senate to secure a treaty ratification might qualify. Abuse of the pardon power might qualify. They have advanced two articles of impeachment against Secretary Mayorkas. The first is that he's willfully and systemically refused to comply with immigration laws enacted by Congress. They're basically saying that his actions have created the crisis at the border. That's what they want to say, yes. And, of course, that's absurd. That crisis has been around for decades. And Mayorkas is following the law as both he and President Biden understand it. Some Democratic lawmakers have said that what the Republicans are complaining about or attacking Mayorkas for is policy. Yes. In fact, for example, the reference to as a basis for one of the impeachment articles, Mayorkas has made various false statements. But if you sort of get behind that, what the articles are really saying is, well, he hasn't said under oath that the situation at the southern border is like what we, the Republicans, think it is. That doesn't make for a false statement. It just means that New York is, you know, from the respect that he's got, he's got a good faith understanding. It's just different than what the Republicans have. That's part of the second article of impeachment. Yes. Knowingly making false statements to Congress and the American people and obstructing congressional oversight of his department. In fact, he's testified before Congress more than any other cabinet member, 27 times in 35 months. And really what's behind that charge is he just hasn't said what they want him to say. He hasn't done what they want him to do. So There's no legitimate basis for impeachment. How unusual is it that they held two public impeachment hearings last month without Mayorkas's in-person testimony or testimony from any fact witnesses? Exactly right. Because this is not about impeachable misconduct. It's about trying to hurt President Biden and his reelection campaign. This is about trying to sort of make a circus out of what's happening down at the border. So the problem with basing impeachment on policy differences is that's what elections are supposed to be about. And it's just absurd to think what the trial is going to look like if there were a trial on this 
because what's going to be put on trial is the Biden immigration policy. And that's ridiculous. You know, impeachment is designed, as I said at the beginning, for serious misconduct or abuse of power that hurts the republic. And uh, having a good faith difference of opinion about what might work at the border and what might not work at the border is well within the bounds of the president and the secretary's discretion. And it's something that is fair game to talk about in a presidential campaign. And two law professors who testified before the committee agree with you. They both stated they did not see a constitutional basis for impeachment. And there are a whole slate of Democrats that House Republicans want to impeach, including, of course, the president. How did we get to this frequent use of impeachment, something that was rare in our history? It happened with Trump and those people that want to sort of follow his lead. So Mike Johnson is very close to Trump. You know, he voted not to impeach Trump either time. And he's working with the kind of far right or the MAGA Republicans in the House to really turn impeachment into a partisan weapon. This is not something that we've had experience with before, because generally speaking, although we've never had a perfect system of politics, impeachment has been something that's been rarely used. But I think one way Republicans can dilute the impeachment of Trump to make it seem less serious is if they just start impeaching everybody. But of course, they're not going to be able to impeach everybody because they'd have to get the moderate Republicans to go along. And there's no prospect whatsoever that any of these things are going to result in the Senate conviction. Yeah. And so the Homeland Security Committee chair, Mark Green, said he feels, quote, pretty good. The same question gets asked, are you just doing something that's going to wind up being fruitless anyway because of the Senate? Well, fine, if that's what they choose to do. But I have a duty to do. Right. Which, by the way, is exactly what House Democrats said when they were faced with the same argument when they were trying to impeach Trump. The Republicans said at that time, oh, this is a waste of time because it's going to die in the Senate. But in my opinion, one big difference between the two impeachments of Trump and these other impeachments is the impeachments against Trump were based on his misconduct. Nobody invented that. He engaged in certain activities that were beyond either the scope of his power or that really seriously injured the Constitution and the rule of law. So I think one reason why we get this kind of whole slew of uh, threats of impeachment is to perhaps desensitize, I guess, the public when it comes to the seriousness of impeachment. They want the public to get sick of it. They want to turn it into a joke. And that's not what impeachment is supposed to be for. It's supposed to be rare. It's supposed to be the last resort in dealing with an abuse of power that cannot be remedied in any other way. The full House is going to vote on this. And the Speaker said the vote will take place as soon as possible. And then it goes to the Senate. Does the Senate have to hold a trial then? That is the big question. The Senate has to do something. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean hold the trial. The Senate has various options. One is to consider point of order to try and dismiss the articles basically for failing to state anything that's impeachable. Another option is to have a trial committee authorized, which would then also consider motions and briefs filed by the parties, one of which might well be this ought to be dismissed because there's no basis for it. And I think The likelihood is that either of those scenarios I just described would be the likeliest possibilities in the Senate because holding a trial on these articles is absurd. As I mentioned before, it's absurd because what the trial would then involve is putting Biden's immigration policy on trial. That's never happened in American history before, and it shouldn't happen here, and I don't think the Senate's going to let it happen. So the Senate could also just run out the clock until the next election? Well, well, I don't know that the Senate will run out the clock. I think they'll reach some resolution. I find it less likely they would just run out the clock. I mean, for one reason, that when you have an impeachment by the rules of the Senate, that tends to displace everything else on the agenda. So the Senate's got an incentive, if anything, to get rid of this quickly. I think the fact that there is no evidence, that Republicans themselves are saying there's no evidence, is a fatal problem with these impeachment articles. And then I also think another fatal problem is impeachment's not supposed to be a partisan weapon. It's supposed to have a lawful purpose, and there's no lawful purpose here. Also, some Democrats are pointing out that it's odd or hypocritical to impeach Mayorkas at the same time that he's working with a group of Senate Republicans to craft a bipartisan deal to update immigration laws, a deal which House Republicans oppose. Exactly. And that tells us something about House Republicans' agenda. 
So I think when, you know, Speaker Mike Johnson says the Senate deal on the border is a dead on arrival and then proceeds to prioritize an impeachment of Mayorkas, that pretty much is telling us all we need to know, because impeaching Mayorkas will not solve the crisis at the border. In fact, Senator Langford, a Republican from Oklahoma, said it's just going to result in Biden putting somebody else in the same office, and that person will do exactly what Mayorkas did. So I think the fact that the House Republicans do not want to consider any compromise bill coming from the Senate tells us that they're not really concerned with whatever is happening at the border, but rather they want to obviously hurt Biden in his reelection campaign. When was the last time anyone who was impeached was convicted in the Senate? Thomas Porteous, a federal trial judge. Porteous was convicted around 2010. But, I mean, there's one cabinet member in American history who was impeached, that's William Belknap, who tried to resign, but the Senate proceeded to hold a trial anyway because he'd been accused of bribery. But it turned out a majority of the Senate essentially voted to acquit him because he was no longer in office. And to put the Mayorkas impeachment in context, there have only been 21 impeachments in our country's history, and only eight were found guilty by the Senate and removed from office, and they were all federal judges, like Judge Porteous. Thanks so much for being on the show, Michael. That's Professor Michael Gerhard of the University of North Carolina School of Law. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show... After the latest $2.3 billion jury verdict against Bayer over its Roundup weed killer, the question is, does the company need a new legal strategy? I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg. In the last three months, Bayer has been hammered by jury verdicts totaling almost $4 billion over its Roundup weed killer. The latest courtroom loss was its biggest since Roundup cases started going to trial about five years ago, with the Pennsylvania jury awarding $2.25 billion to a former Roundup user who blamed his cancer diagnosis on long-term exposure to the herbicide. That prompted a fresh slump in Bayer shares as investors worried about the more than 50,000 Roundup claims outstanding. And that raises the question of whether Bayer needs a new legal strategy and what new game plan is even available. Joining me is an expert in mass tort litigation, Elizabeth Birch, a professor at the University of Georgia School of Law. So Bayer's latest courtroom loss was its biggest since Roundup cases started going to trial. Aren't companies supposed to learn from past trials and avoid these huge verdicts? One would certainly hope so, although I think, you know, Bayer would probably mention that they've won 10 of the last 16 trials. I think their hope certainly is to try to get a case like this reversed on appeal. And there is some precedent for that in the past. Back in 2019, a California jury awarded roughly $2.05 billion in damages that ended up getting slashed to $87 million. So still a lot of money, but certainly not money with a B. You know, Bayer, it's vowed to appeal, express confidence that it will prevail, and it says it's not giving up as far as trying cases. But what is its strategy? Because it did settle. It did spend about $10 billion on settling 150,000 cases. You're right. It absolutely did. And um, it also indicated, I think a year or two ago, that it was planning to pull Roundup off the market in the next couple of years. I think the hope being that at some point these cases will stop. But the difficulty that Bayer is facing is that there's a long gap between exposure to Roundup and then the potential for developing some sort of a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or a different type of cancer in these types of cases. So it's really hard to say, you know, even if we were to pull Roundup off the market tomorrow, when the litigation might end. This isn't the only multi-billion dollar verdict in a mass tort case. Is there a reason why these verdicts are reaching what, you know, I'd consider astronomical figures? Yeah, I mean, you know, the juries are not happy with the evidence that they hear. There is evidence that they are wanting to punish the company. So this isn't just sort of a slap on the wrist, let's compensate the victim type of damage award. This is a you've done something really wrong and we're angry about it kind of award. It certainly seems they're angry. So Bayer is facing now... Ten trials are expected this year in state courts. 
It says the company is committed to trying Roundup cases based on the strength of the science, favorable regulatory assessments worldwide, and a proven record of success at trial. It was successful until I think it was October when plaintiffs started racking up victories in California, Missouri, and Pennsylvania state courts. Did something happen where the cases started to turn against Bayer? You know, it's hard to pinpoint a particular sea change. They were certainly successful in settling a bulk of those cases through what's known as the multi-district litigation process. That's at the federal level. But where they're really facing pressure now is at the state level, uh, particularly in jurisdictions like Philadelphia. Do you know, does Bayer use the same legal team for these cases or do they change up legal teams? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I haven't followed who their lead lawyers are in these cases, but it's not uncommon for there to be several big law firms involved in handling a litigation like this. Does Bayer have enough money in its, you know, litigation coffers to settle these cases or to pay them even? (laughs) Well, I mean, that certainly remains to be seen. No money goes to the victims while cases are on appeal. And as you know, appeals can last for a couple of years. So um, certainly there's that question if Bayer is going to continue to face these types of billion-dollar verdicts, whether at some point it's going to become an issue. But they haven't indicated that they are considering filing for bankruptcy, to my knowledge. And as you said, even if they settle some cases, because Roundup is still on the market, they're exposed to future litigation. Exactly. So um, you can't sue just because you've been exposed to a chemical. You can only sue once something has manifested, some sort of injury has manifested, which means that if it takes some, you know, 10 to 14 years between the exposure to the product and the development of the disease, that we're going to be looking at these types of lawsuits for many years to come. Do you know why Bayer didn't take Roundup off the market? What went into their calculation? I can only assume it's because it's still a pretty big seller. You know, when they contemplated taking it off the market and indicated that they were going to take it off the market in the future, they were trying to come up with something that was equally effective at killing weeds. And that was going to take some time to develop, was my understanding. So I think they're trying to have some sort of replacement for it as soon as they pull it from the shelves. And there's contradictory scientific evidence and opinions from different agencies about whether the chemical in Roundup is a carcinogen and whether it's cancerous? That's correct. And I think that's part of uh, what juries might be struggling with and, and maybe the reason for the 10 wins that they've had at trial. So back in 2015, part of the World Health Organization called the International Agency for Research on Cancer classified the chemical that's used in Roundup glycophosphate as part of a chemical that is probably carcinogenic in humans. But the EPA back in 2010 said there were no risks to human health. So we really have some conflicting findings between different organizations. Have plaintiff's attorneys had a different strategy in the latest cases? You know, I think every case is probably unique in the sense that you're really highlighting the facts of your particular client. And I think what we see in this latest case is not just the use of kind of garden variety roundup on a half acre plot of land, but sustained use over a fairly large plot of land, um, multiple acres and many, many gallons of roundup sprayed at a time. So you really do see a high volume of exposure And it's possible that the cases that have been lost are cases with more casual use. So we talked about the possibility of future cases, but plaintiffs who sue in the future, are they on notice of the possible cancer-causing agents in Roundup? So this is one of the questions that we'll have to see in the future. You know, the, the cases that we're seeing right now don't have notice about this potential for cancer. But in tort law, there's something called the assumption of the risk and uh, defense called comparative fault, which means, you know, for example, that if you're a smoker and you've been smoking for a long time, but you know that smoking can cause lung cancer, then you bear some sort of fault in continuing to smoke. So we may see defenses like that becoming more successful in the future. Another front that Bayer still hopes 
will be successful is convincing U.S. appeals courts that federal law preempts state-based claims? Well, um, the preemption question has been out there for a long time. It's not something that they've been successful on thus far. And so, you know, I think that that's still a really open question that remains to be seen, but they haven't gotten a lot of traction with it. Would it be possible for Bayer to negotiate a global settlement of these claims? I think it's going to be really difficult for them at this point. They certainly tried to negotiate a global settlement several years ago when they tried to certify these cases as a class action in federal court. That was a move that was denied by the judge in the federal multidistrict litigation. It would be really difficult, I think, without uh, plaintiff's consent and plaintiff's attorney's consent to get any sort of a global settlement given that we're now looking at individual state court litigation. The Roundup litigation, is it creating a cloud over the company itself? Certainly. I mean, you know, we see shares of Bayer falling almost 3% before the jury announced their verdict. And the shareholders are certainly watching this. So this is a litigation that is the thorn in the side of Bayer. If you were advising Bayer, How would you advise them to handle all these cases? (laughs) I mean, try to settle. I mean, it's a real problem. Um, There's not a way to get any kind of global resolution based on the types of things that we know now. So the easiest way to try to do something like that would be to file bankruptcy. But Bayer has not indicated that I know of that they have any sort of plans of filing bankruptcy in the future. But in order to try to get rid of state and federal cases and any kind of holistic settlement, most defendants are looking at bankruptcy. Johnson & Johnson tried to get the Supreme Court to hear its appeal over a $2.1 billion talc award, and the court refused. That was back in 2021 Remind us of where the court stands on these punitive damage awards. The Supreme Court back in the 90s decided several cases, a trilogy of cases on punitive damages that capped, essentially capped the ratio between compensatory damages and punitive damages is no greater than nine to one. Now, there can certainly be some exceptions to that. But in general, the Supreme Court has weighed in. and So this is what we think would be appropriate. But the Supreme Court really has not gotten involved in these types of mass tort settlements. In fact, the the closest that we've really seen recently has been the argument in front of the Supreme Court over the Purdue Pharma case, where the Sackler family is trying to free ride on the bankruptcy of Purdue to avoid uh, civil liability for the opioid epidemic. Can the Roundup litigation be compared to the talc litigation? Is it similar It is similar. Like Roundup, there is a latency period in talc, particularly between the exposure to talc. Some would say that exposure to talc laced with asbestos between the exposure and the development of the disease. So I think both Johnson & Johnson in the talc cases and Bayer in the Roundup cases are struggling with how do we get closure in a case like this where there are likely to be many more cases in the pipeline for years to come. I've been noticing recently that not just in this area, but in many areas, there are just stunning jury verdicts. You know, I think what we see oftentimes is in the headlines, we get these astronomical verdicts because they are so newsworthy and they're so fun to report. But it's important to remember that in about 80 percent of the cases, judges and juries actually agree on what the amount should be. And so when you see verdicts like this, they aren't necessarily the -the run-of-the-mill cases. They're typically some kind of an aberration, and there might well be a reason for that. Thanks so much for being on the show, Elizabeth, and giving us your insights into this complex area of litigation. That's Professor Elizabeth Birch of the University of Georgia School of Law. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show... Harvard University is facing congressional investigations as well as an investigation by the Department of Education. I'm June Grosso and you're listening to Bloomberg. Harvard University is still struggling to resolve tensions after President Claudine Gay resigned last month amid an onslaught of criticism over her response to anti-Semitism as well as accusations of plagiarism in her scholarship. The school is under investigation by congressional committees and the Department of Education. 
Joining me is Janet Lauren, the Bloomberg Higher Education and Finance Reporter. How many House committees are investigating Harvard? So two congressional committees are investigating Harvard. The House Education and the Workforce Committee has two inquiries going on. And the House Ways and Means Committee has has its own inquiry. And you'll remember that the House Ways and Means Committee called Harvard President Claudine Gay, as well as the presidents of MIT and Penn for that now infamous hearing on December 5th. And it's sort of amazing that two of them were fired or had to leave. Yes. And there's there's been pressure on the third president, Sally Kornbluth at MIT, for her to step down. But her board has been pretty supportive. They came out right after the hearing in support of her. And the Harvard board was pretty supportive until these plagiarism allegations came up with Gay, right? Yes. They came out on December 12th with a statement that they support her and she was the right leader for Harvard. And then uh, you started seeing more plagiarism charges coming out. But also there was a couple of other things that we reported on and we you know, broke the news on about Harvard, including a 17 percent decline in early applications, the second congressional inquiry that came up at the end of December, and then another uh, big donor pulled out, Len Blavatnik, who had donated almost $300 million to Harvard. And, and we also wrote a lot about the constrained finances. So while certainly plagiarism was taking up a lot of space and energy, there are also a lot of financial constraints to Harvard. And you think, well, they have a $51 billion in and how could that be possible? How? Well, because they rely quite a lot on fundraising. They've raised over a billion dollars every year since 2014, and people have been pulling back. Uh, now, granted, we're not going to know the full numbers until June 30th of this year. Their endowment returns have not been great. They haven't seen these double-digit returns for many years. Of course, everyone did in 2021, but Harvard lagged its peers. And they also are spending a lot. And also, one of their biggest donors is the federal government. 11% of their budget last year came from the federal government in scientific research grants and other grants. Um, And that money also doesn't include $105 million in federal loans that the government gave uh, to its students. So they're very generous in financial aid for undergraduates, but graduate students have to borrow. So these congressional hearings and inquiries, and then we haven't even talked about the education department's separate inquiry. There's a lot going on at Harvard. Their legal bills are mounting, and they added an additional law firm to help them um, with the congressional committee work. So Wilmer Hale, that law firm, was the only law firm who prepared Gay for her testimony. Is that the case? That's my understanding, but a place like Harvard is very complicated. So, you know, Wilmer Hale, we know, did a ton of legal work for the affirmative action case. And that was another you know, legal challenge that Harvard lost that had, I'm sure, racked up a lot of legal expenses. And on June 29th, Harvard lost that case in the Supreme Court. Was Wilmer Hale doing this work pro bono? So one attorney at Wilmer Hale, um, Bill Lee, used to be the chairman of their governing board, which is called the Harvard Corporation, and his title was senior fellow. And Harvard had had discussed that he personally did not charge for his own time advising Harvard in the affirmative action case. But that doesn't mean the entire law firm uh, wasn't being paid. My understanding is it was. And they were also advising the Penn president. Yes, uh, they did advise the Penn president, and they're also advising Penn on their Ways and Means inquiry. And I should note that Ways and Means is not only Harvard, it's also Penn, MIT, and Cornell. Is there something about Wilmer Hale? Do they have a specific department that handles education? Is there a reason why they're so involved? Well, my understanding is there was a connection with Bill Lee. Um, again, is the senior fellow, former chairman of the board at, at Harvard. And he did a lot of the work for the admissions case. So perhaps they retained them to do other work. I know that Ropes and Gray had been a longtime firm for Harvard. But again, there, there's a lot of legal work, zoning, you know, real estate, investments. It's a, it's a $6 billion operation. So they, they must have a lot of different firms. And then one of the reports about plagiarism talked about another firm that they had employed during, you know, the questions. 
in one of the um, congressional reports that came out, uh, Harvard released a summary, said another firm that they had employed was Claire Locke. And that was, again, uh, specifically about the plagiarism charge. So now they're hiring another firm, King & Spaulding, to come on and work with Wilmer Hale? Yes, that is correct. So now, where does the plagiarism investigation stand? Is it is it over? So that was granted an extension on December 29th. They turned in um, reports to, you know, addressing the inquiry, and we don't know where that stands. Um, and then the anti-Semitism inquiry, and we had a story about that as well. And that story was about Harvard's inadequate uh, answer to the probe. And, you know, if you read the statement that Virginia Fox, the chairman of the committee, again, the, the, the very person who called the December 5th hearing, she said that Harvard could face compulsory measures if it fails to cooperate with the inquiry. And that means, you know, they have the authority to issue subpoenas. Is this usual for congressional committees to be investigating private schools? Well, that's an excellent question. Why is Congress in, involving itself in private schools? And the answer is something we touched on earlier. Harvard and a lot of other research universities get a ton of money from the federal government. Um, they got hundreds of millions of dollars annually in federal research grants. Um, their students last year got $105 million in federal student loans to borrow for graduate school, like at Harvard Law School. You know, it's $110,000 or so. It's a lot. Harvard Business School. Um, and plus, their students get Pell Grants. So the federal government is one of the biggest annual donors to Harvard and other research universities. So is it fair that Congress is grilling them? You know, some might say they want to know how their money is being spent. And the question about plagiarism involved, how is Harvard handling this inquiry, especially in light of how it handles plagiarism with students and other faculty members? And there were also questions about its accreditor. And Harvard cannot get any federal money unless it's accredited. And what specifically is the anti-Semitism investigation about? So the Education Committee asked, um, I believe it was 24 sets of questions, so a lot, um, looking at how they were handling anti-Semitism, looking at, you know, asking for correspondence. They also asked questions about the Jewish population over time because there had been questions about that it had declined. And, wa- you know, they wanted to know a lot of things. And Penn received the same inquiry last week. And the Education Department, what is its investigation about? Now, that's a completely separate investigation. And, you know, almost three dozen colleges are also being investigated. Last week, I believe Yale and Northwestern were added. And again, same group of colleges, Harvard, MIT, Penn, Cornell, you know, a lot of schools. And that is looking at discrimination. And it's about Title VI of the Federal Civil Rights Act. Is there a date coming up that we have to keep our eye on? They haven't announced any more committee hearings, but that's always possible. Waiting to hear more back about the Education Committee probe into anti-Semitism, what happens with the plagiarism inquiry, what happens with Ways and Means. And I'll add, um, Ways and Means also did its own inquiry around 2016 with the Senate Finance Committee, and they asked a whole host of questions about their endowment, spending, fees from their investment managers, when do you not take money from donors, we did a, a lot of fun stories when that came out. <laughs> fun for you, not fun for the schools. But, but, but they were answering questions like, when do you turn down money? So that was really insightful. And people thought, well, th- nothing's going to happen of this. And what happened in 2017 as part of the Trump tax package, they slapped an endowment tax on schools. More than three dozen schools now pay 1.4% on their net wow. investment returns, a couple hundred million dollars. Uh, and that goes to fund corporate tax cuts. So I'm not going to say nothing's going to happen, that it's a political witch hunt, because I don't think that's the case. You see, there was many Democrats who are signed a a resolution to condemn the testimony. There have been Democrats uh, on the committee and other committees who have been very upset and concerned about anti-Semitism on campus. So I don't see that it's a witch hunt at all. I think that would be a mistake to assume that. And, you know, we'll see what's going to happen. So many things have been coming out of left field that you can't really anticipate. 
I can't tell you what's going to happen. Well, you did a good job of telling us what is happening. Thanks so much, Janet. That's Janet Lauren, Bloomberg Higher Education and Finance Reporter. And in other legal news today, for the first time, a mother is standing trial for a mass shooting by her child. Jennifer Crumbly is on trial for the murders of four students in a shooting rampage at a Michigan high school in November of 2021, the worst school shooting in the state's history. It was her 15-year-old son, Ethan, who pulled the trigger, but prosecutors are trying to hold her responsible for what they say is willful negligence of her son's deteriorating mental health and warning signs that he was contemplating violence. But her defense attorney argues that Crumbly had no reason to believe her son posed a threat. And today, Jennifer Crumbly took the witness stand in her own defense. She testified that she and her son had a strong relationship. I trusted him, and I felt like I had an open door and he can come to me about anything. I mean, I felt, I felt as a family, we were, we were, the three of us were really close. Crumbly also said she never noticed her son having major mental health struggles. There was a couple of times where Ethan expressed anxiety over taking tests, um, anxiety about what he was going to do after high school, whether it was college, uh, military. Crumley is being tried for involuntary manslaughter, which carries a maximum sentence of 15 years in prison. Ethan's father, James Crumbly, will also be tried for involuntary manslaughter at a separate trial in March. As for Ethan... He was sentenced to life in prison in December after he pleaded guilty to murder, terrorism, and other crimes. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Podcast. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news by subscribing and listening to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. I'm June Grosso, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.